right, excellent. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, let me sh begin sharing my screen and uh, do let me know if you can hear me okay. Uh, hopefully you can, uh, but if you if you cannot hear me, please do let me know uh, <laughs> sooner rather than later so I don't keep going on uh, without uh, without your, your being able to hear me. All right, so uh, let's get uh, started here. Let me try to minimize the video feed. Uh, put it up here. Yeah, that works. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you very much, Siraj. Really appreciate it. All right, so uh, this talk is a free economic take on open standards in Jakarta. Uh, frankly, I'm very, very uh, happy that JCon decided to um, to have this talk, and in fact, I'm also very, very uh, grateful to uh, all of you uh, for coming to this talk. This talk is not fundamentally about uh, technologies or APIs or anything else like that. It is more along the lines of sharing ideas, frankly, um, or fundamental concepts of why some of these things like open standards and Jakarta EE uh, are really, really important. Uh, so if you don't know me, uh, brief introductions. My name is Reza Rahman. Uh, in my day job, I'm principal program manager for Java and Azure at Microsoft. Uh, but honestly, uh, that's not the hat I'm wearing, at least for this talk for the most part. Uh, you know, I've, I've been, before my day job, I've been involved in uh, open standards in Jakarta E for um, a lot longer than that. It's almost, been almost 15, 20 years now. Uh, and I actually come from a specific background. And uh, that background is really what is reflected in this talk uh, and why I've done what I've done for the past 15 or 20 years. And, and basically, I'm going to relate to you uh, those exact reasons in hope that uh, you, know, you will also understand this particular perspective and uh, you understand uh, why maybe you should also be taking the same path that I have uh, done uh, so many years ago. So, okay, so uh, my contact information is on screen. Um, I am, uh, I think, relatively reachable. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll specifically share my uh, ways of uh, contacting, contacting me. There's many different ways of doing that. Uh, and of course, uh, part of the reasons I'm here is to do that, is to establish that connection with you as well. So before I get started, uh, I, I will try to absolutely stay on time. In fact, we'll try to uh, end it a bit early so that we can have uh, allocate specific time for Q&A. But beyond that, um, let me also tell you that uh, this talk is not just about a lecture per se. Um, I do want this to be pretty interactive, to be honest with you. So what I'd encourage you to do is I will have uh, these natural pauses in, in, in during this presentation where you can ask me questions. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways you can ask me questions. Uh, you can certainly uh, put something in the chat. It's going to be a bit harder for me to see that, uh, but I will do that. Uh, when there's a natural pause, I will check the chat to see if there's questions there. Uh, and we'll do, uh, I'll answer those questions as we, as we go along throughout the presentation. So it won't be something at the very end. Uh, but also, uh, I would encourage you to simply come off mute and even turn off your camera if you don't mind uh, and uh, ask your question uh, and uh, have a dialogue with me as we go along in, in this talk. I'm not so concerned about uh, covering a specific bit of ground. I'm much more interested actually in having a dialogue with you and, and really surface these ideas in a concrete way. So part of uh, the title is something, a word called Freakonomics. That may or may not be a new word to you. Uh, so I did want to explain uh, a bit more about what precisely free economics is and why this talk uh, it goes along the lines of that philosophy of free economics. So um, before I do that, let me explain a bit of my own background. Uh, although I am a computer scientist and in, uh, when I graduated uh, from, uh, for even from my undergraduate courses, it was very clear to me that computing is the path that I wanted to pursue and uh, part of my majors is in, in fact, in computer science. But the other uh, aspect of academia that really interested me and, and still continues to interest me to some extent, uh, uh, I believe, is economics. So I actually am a double major in computer science and economics. So most people, when they hear of economics, they think it's about dollars and cents and finances and banking and uh, macroeconomic skills and supply and demand. Uh, and central banks and so on. But actually economics is, is much more broader than that. Um, although there is definitely a financial aspect to economics, economics is actually the study of human behavior uh, and understanding how, how human behavior, what motivates human beings and why they do the things they do 
Uh, and either individually or collectively, when we take certain actions, what is the impact of those actions on uh, any given society or economy? That is really fundamentally the heart of what economics is. So a uh, uh, couple of gentlemen, uh, when, when I, and, and we all know this as, as economists, but few other people outside of the field of economics really know that that, what, that is what economics is actually about. So these two gentlemen, uh, Stephen David uh, Levitt and uh, Stephen Dubner, uh, they actually uh, have crystallized this uh, truth in a very concrete way. They wrote a book some years ago, it's called, it's called Freakonomics. Uh, and basically, what if you haven't read this book, I really definitely recommend that you do. But basically what this book is about is that it takes a look at everyday situations, things that you wouldn't think uh, economics covers, uh, and uh, explains those phenomena from an economic lens. And uh, I think just some really good insights uh, are there. All kinds of social issues uh, are crystallized there. So my talk, uh, that's sort of what inspired me uh, to do to formulate this talk uh, uh, in, in the end. I said, okay, you know, if these gentlemen can, can explain uh, that, yes, you can take economic concepts and apply them in non-economic uh, or traditionally non-economic concepts, essentially I, am, I have been doing the same thing for a while now. Uh, part of the reasons why uh, I contribute to Jakarta E and Open Standards specifically is because of that view of taking a look at this space from an economic lens. So let me do the same thing. Let me try to explain uh, through a talk uh, why these things are important, especially from an economic perspective. Now, do you have to be an economist to understand uh, the content of this talk? I really don't think so. Uh, I think just like Freakonomics is an accessible book and pretty much anybody uh, can pick up this book and understand what it is saying. I believe so similarly, uh, you know, certainly professionals in, in the computer science field will similarly understand what I'm trying to convey in this talk as well. So bear with me and we'll see if that is actually true or not. All right, so standards are everywhere. Uh, often they are invisible and uh, to some extent that is really what we want uh, in the end. We want uh, all of these standards defining uh, all kinds of uh, activities, uh, certainly in technology and, and way beyond technology actually. Uh, and they, they provide, uh, in my opinion, actually a foundation for how the modern world actually operates without open standards. I think a lot of these things uh, that are much more efficient uh, today and much more functional today would not be as functional at all. Wherever you look, you will begin to see them if you look at it from the right lens, whether it's uh, something like uh, LSB that's behind the Linux uh, operating systems or something like ANSI SQL uh, to, of course, Java SE, which by the way is an open standard or POSIX or IEEE or OSGI or HTML. Wherever you look, you, there's actually uh, open, open standards and specifications are everywhere. So you should ask yourself why that is. Uh, it is, is it merely by, by uh, accident uh, or is there some fundamental reason behind that? And in my opinion, not a lot of people actually examine those reasons or, or begin or seek to understand why is it uh, that open standards are so pervasive and why is it that, that they are so important and what function do they serve uh, in technology and beyond? So in terms of standards uh, and specifications, these are the specific purposes that uh, open standards uh, or and specifications uh, are there for. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on the last one, uh, which is maintaining healthy competitive ecosystems. Uh, and this is going to be the, the primary focus of why standards, but uh, believe me, this is only nearly one reason. Even if you didn't believe in this particular reason, there are many other reasons why open standards and specifications are important. So let's talk about a few of them uh, very briefly on this slide before we move forward and uh, really focus on the competitive aspect and healthy uh, ecosystem aspect of open standards and Jakarta E more specifically. So standards promote interoperability. Um, basically, what this means is that when you have a defined interface that you can rely upon and is agreed upon be, be, uh, between a consumer or, or producer or several different parties, what this means is that uh, you can then reliably interoperate, in other words, work together 
uh, in, uh, through, through, through multiple different parties because you had this agreed upon standard. So interoperability is an important aspect of standards. Compatibility and portability is another aspect of it, but this has to do more with definitely with supplier and producer. In other words, consumer and the people that are consuming uh, a software or a bit of technology and the people that are producing it. Uh, so what compatibility and portability means is that when you are uh, using a product that uh, is conforming to a standard and you as a consumer are conscious about what you're going to use uh, and uh, only uh, consume what is defined by the standard, what that means is that you can switch implementations, you can switch providers very easily. And that's what portability and compatibility means. Similar, similar uh, concept for uh, even operating systems. So, so let's say you are a consumer in the sense that you write software for Linux. Because uh, Linux confirms these different standards in the POSIX and LSB, what means is you don't have to rewrite your application every single time. You can simply write to the LSB and POSIX standards and more or less be able to port over your application very easily from one Linux platform to the other. So that's compatibility and portability. Reliable baseline quality of service. This is very, very important uh, in case of mission critical infrastructure, right? So if you have different providers that provide different things, when you have a standard, that standard actually defines, guarantees a specific baseline quality of service. You know what is going to be provided. A uh, good example of that is Wi-Fi providers, right? So when, when you say, I want generation three or generation four Wi-Fi, you know precisely what that means. You know, uh, if a provider says, okay, I want, I provide this level of service, you know precisely what that level of service means. It's not just arbitrary and whatever it is uh, that the provider feels like providing you at, right at that moment. Uh, same thing for broadband, right? If you get, if you get a broadband connection, uh, they will tell you, okay, I, I conform to such and such a standard of, of the service that I'm providing you. Uh, similar, again, a, another corollary of this is even if you are not a direct consumer of something, uh, but it is something very important that a lot of people depend on, and then, and then the this, this sort of multiplier effect of an entire ecosystem that depends on that particular thing, in order for that thing to be stable uh, and be supported by all these multiple parties, it's much better if it is an open standard or a specification because that is more resilient. Right? So uh, th those can survive things like acquisitions or uh, economic upheavals or simply person personnel changes and the like. So it, it is important for a stable, when you have an ecosystem, it's better to base that ecosystem on, on a standard. Um, same thing with maximizing vendor implementation neutrality, minimizing lock-in risks. Uh, this is very similar in, in a sense to compatibility and the compatibility and portability point. You want a, a level of decoupling between you and the provider so that you can switch providers very easily if you needed to uh, for whatever the reason, whether it's quality of service, whether it's pricing, uh, what have you. Uh, and reducing unnecessary fragmentation. And this, we, this is a side effect of healthy competitive ecosystems, as we'll explain just in a moment. When you don't have, uh, when you don't have uh, open standards, something that is based on open standards, two things can happen, either under competition, uh, two li very likely outcomes, either I under competition, which is very bad, which is bad for many other reasons, as we'll explore in a moment, or hyper competition. Right. In, other, in that situation, you are needing to frivolously make choices as a consumer, right? Whether you're, you're forced to choose vendor A or B without any real good reason, without real, real, uh, real reasons, and it's sort of arbitrary why this happens. So um, it's open standards also help to reduce this kind of fragmentation as well. Um, USB is a, is a good example. So if all uh, uh, providers said, okay, you, you are going to uh, your the adapters that you use for all, any possible bit of hardware is going to conform to this particular uh, connector, let's say a USB connector, that reduces unnecessary fragmentation. So uh, vendors can simply choose whatever kind of connector that they want. And you, uh, as, a, as a consumer, then you have to make a choice. You either have to pick this product or this product, and there's really no good reason why you should be forced into making those choices. 
Okay, so let me stop there a moment and I'm going to, uh, uh, so this is quite a bit of things, quite a few reasons why open solutions are important. But like I said, the one we are going to focus on today is maintaining healthy competitive ecosystems and why does open standards help you do that? And to me, this is the most important reason uh, and, and probably the defining reason why uh, I've chosen to, uh, chosen to invest in open standards uh, and, and namely Jakarta E and Jakarta e, Java E for such a long time. So again, uh, quite a bit of things to chew on. I'm going to pause a little bit. I'm going to check the uh, the uh, check the uh, chat now. And also, uh, this is a good moment for you to come off mute and ask me any questions if you so wish. Okay, so let us see. Check the chat. Okay. Nobody uh, wants to say, ask me any questions quite yet, which is fine. It's still er very early on on the talk, that's fine. Uh, so I'll just give you uh, a few more moments uh, and I'll pause. I'll uh, let you come off mute if you would like to, uh, but otherwise we'll uh, move forward and uh, try to keep, try to stay on time. Okay, so I assume no questions, let's move forward. And make sure, okay. So you don't have to take my word for any of this. Um, there's a bunch of people that will provide um, a lot of the same material that I'm doing for you. I'm just doing it in a more condensed, uh, ho I hope easy to understand format, but this is a well-researched topic. Um, a, one of, a few of the organizations that really put out a lot of uh, valuable material on the fundamentals of why open standards are important is ISO or the International Standards Organization. Uh, but there's other organizations like uh, IAAA and ACM uh, that also uh, do similar things. They actually put out fundamentally, um, they, they do uh, studies in, including economic impact studies uh, and really produce out a lot of literature on why is all this stuff even matter. All right. So in order to understand what we are going to talk about today, uh, namely the impact of open standards in, uh, in maintaining healthy competitive ecosystems, you will learn to understand a specific uh, economic concept. And I don't think it's, it's a particularly difficult concept to understand. It is called the network effect. And this is something that was observed uh, in the early 60s and 70s in a more formal way. I think people uh, understood these concepts uh, in a more uh, intuitive way before that. So uh, we've had uh, anti-competition -com laws and anti-monopoly laws, I think ever since the 19, 1930s for some good reasons, but people didn't really quite understand why, why that was. Uh, but in the, certainly in the 1960s and 70s, economists observed uh, this uh, very, in a very formal and structured way, this concept called the network effect. Uh, and the network effect is actually very important in understanding the competitive dynamic, dynamics in all kinds of technology spaces, but even beyond technology, the, these concepts apply. So let's talk a little bit about, about the network effect and um, the most easy diagram to explain this with uh, is the one that you see here. Uh, it is a di diagram that I have borrowed uh, and it shouldn't be too big of a surprise that this comes from uh, essentially uh, telephones uh, or telecommunication, uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, cases where these concepts of the network effect and its effect on, on monopolies was applied is uh, American uh, tele telecom, telecom company called AT&T. Okay, that is the original, original company from, uh, yeah, that actually invented the phones and became at, at one point in time a monopoly that had to be broken up. And the fundamental uh, ideas behind that in the legal arguments actually came from the network effect. So let's, let's understand the network effect. So let's pretend for a company, uh, for, uh, let's pretend for a moment that you live in a small town somewhere, right? let's say in a, somewhere in, in Nevada or uh, Montana or some other remote state. And uh, you have a few uh, telephone companies to uh, telephone options uh, that you can choose from. One is just uh, you have uh, you ran a line from you from your house to your uh, in-laws' house, and you have your own little company as a, as a result. So you can pick up the phone, and you can dial. You can immediately auto dial your uh, your uh, brother-in-law or sister-in-law, and that's all you have. It's just a one, a two, two uh, phones connected by a single line. Now you have another option uh, where you have a cooperative, and let's say you got together in, in with your neighborhood. 
Uh, and then we said, okay, yeah, we have five households uh, in our neighborhood and we're all going to connect uh, up and create our own little little phone company and we'll, we'll do a cooperative. It's jointly owned. But really, when it comes down to it, when you pick up the phone, you can only dial one of five numbers, you can, you know, hashtag one through five, and then you connect up to whichever house that, that you want to connect to. And then there is uh, the town uh, phone system. Uh, where you can call basically everybody in town. Everybody in town is connected. Uh, and similarly, taking this to the opposite extreme, you know, you can call anybody in, in the world, which is uh, actually how phone networks operate today because of what happened with AT&T and because of these laws uh, that actually, uh, actually stem from the, uh, the concept of the network effect. Which one of these uh, uh, networks are you going to choose? Quite naturally, you will most likely choose the one that is most interconnected. So you will choose a network not because of quality of service or price or anything else like that. The most valuable thing for you in this case would be how many other people are, are, are using this particular product or technology. So the larger the network, the more consumers a, a particular provider has, the stronger market, market position they will have. It's not necessarily has anything to do with the merit of the technology or the merit of what they're offering. It's just a matter of market dynamics in terms of how many people happen to be using that particular thing. So this is a legitimate, uh, uh, so this is a, a legitimate uh, reason, right? From an economic standpoint, why you should pick this. But what this means is that there's definitely a monopoly effect. Right. So the larger the company, the more of the market share that they can gobble up, the more consumers they get, the more power they will have, uh, as opposed to a smaller company that doesn't have uh, as many uh, as, 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 as many customers or as many things that they can rely upon. Uh, and this is fundamentally true of many different things. Uh, the example here is uh, phone systems, but really, in terms of technology, anything that is based on something else, right? When all foundational types of technologies are subject to this network effect. You are going to want to use things that uh, many other people are using. This applies to operating systems. Uh, it applies to even things like browsers. Even it even applies to things like uh, Java frameworks and programming languages. The more people that are using this particular thing, the more beneficial it is for you to use uh, that particular thing, which means the person that is, that is providing that thing has an inherent monopolistic advantage because of the market dynamics. So let's check uh, the chat. I did see one chat that uh, came in and this is from Siraj. Uh, to what extent does profitability hinder the adoption of open standards by companies? Um, Profitability and open standards actually uh, are not uh, in competition with each other. So uh, the question is commoditization, right? So uh, uh, the more it is a question of are standards commodities? They can be. Uh, you can say that, okay, I want, I'm a particular inventor of this thing. Uh, and yes, even though it has, uh, it has inherently subject to the network effect, um, I have a right to this because uh, you know I, I invented it and hence I, you know nobody should be able to stop me and I should be able to make whatever profit I want uh, off of it. The problem is uh, mar uh, market systems don't work like that. Uh, then it's it's not laissez-faire like do whatever you want uh, because at the end of the day those one wind up with outcomes that are not necessarily good for society or consumers. They may be. Uh, beneficial to only a small uh, subset of, of, of the society, namely the person that owns this particular technology or company, but not good for anybody else. So this is the reason why there is a check and balance of what is, uh, you know, how much profit should you be able to make versus uh, when do you, when should you apply things like standardization, where it limits the profitability of a certain party, but actually it maximizes the value for a majority of the market. Okay, so, and it's not necessarily accurate that, uh, you know, just because you uh, and something is an open standard, you can't make money off of it. That's not really true. You can create products or services that conform to these standards. In fact, you know, if you go back and take a look at the examples, 
you know, all kinds of profitable things are based on based on open standards of one kind or the other. You may even say that having open standards actually expands the market size and makes the market size bigger than it would otherwise be. But it, it's a good question. And uh, it's definitely not uh, a straightforward uh, answer. And it's not a black or white answer. There are balances there, but uh, in general, where there's a network effect and where there is a possibility of something becoming becoming a monopoly, it's advantageous to have an open standard answer instead. Okay. All right. So when you have this uh, concept of concept of uh, a, a network effect, really you will wind up with two different outcomes uh, because of, of the forces of behind that network effect. You will either end up with an open standard, or you will wind up with something called a de facto standard. And they both have the word standard in them. You might think they're the same, but in fact, they are not. They're, they're very different things. And in fact, in many ways, they are diametrically opposite of each other. Now, the other thing to understand is um, in economics, everything is an abstraction. So uh, just uh, a de facto standard does not mean, you know, that, okay, it needs to follow the letter of the law, and there is only one choice, uh, and that is the only choice, and nobody can ever enter that market. That's almost never the case, right? So there will be smaller players, minor players, but in fact, it's a question of, uh, in effect, is it really a de facto standard? Does it have sufficient markets? It does something have sufficient market cloud, clout to essentially be considered a monopoly, even though it may not be the only player in a given space. So again, when you have a network effect in play, uh, because of those dynamics, because of the fact that you have economies of scale uh, in terms of usage, you will either wind up with an open standard or you will wind up with a de facto standard. Now, again, you don't have to take my word for these things. So folks like the ISO and IEEE and uh, a bunch of other people have classified these kind of standards. So this is actually uh, a deck, deck within a deck um, that, I, uh, that I borrowed uh, that comes from the ISO. Uh, so there, again, there are two different types of standards. There are de jure standards or open standards, uh, and there are de facto standards, and they are very, very different. Uh, a de facto standard reflects a market reality. Uh, it simply means that uh, something is the only game that matters because uh, it has sort of won in one way or the other in the marketplace. Uh, they do provide some benefits. Uh, you know, they, they do realize, for example, the, the benefits of the network effect, but they effectively are monopoly or near monopolies in, in their space. Uh, so they do have some if you will, benefits, uh, but there are much, there are a lot of problems, and we'll talk about those problems in, in a moment when that happens. When you when you have essentially have a, effectively a monopoly, uh, you have a lack of transparency. Uh, often, uh, you know, because you hold market power, you don't have to be very transparent. You don't have to be very responsive to a market. You can define things uh, to advantage yourself. Okay. Uh, and you can also limit information. So we'll talk about the, the problems with de facto standards and monopoly power in general. Uh, de jure standards uh, are the, almost the opposite. Right? In that particular case, you actually have market players that agree that uh, there, there is a network effect and they need to offset the network effect by creating an interface that they all conform to and they can all produce the same thing, things that look basically the same but, but are provided by different, different, completely different sets of people. Um, they, uh, the critical features of this is that there's due process, we'll talk more about this in a moment, that ensures transparency and ensures uh, full participation of anyone that, any stakeholder that is interested. There is openness built in uh, and everything is defined by consensus, often not just consensus of the producers, but consensus between the consumers and the producers. Uh, the downsides of it is yes, it takes a bit longer. It's a, it's a, you know, there's an African proverb that says, if you want to um, go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go long, you have to bring your village along with you. Uh, so this, yes, uh, open standards or digital standards do take longer to develop than simply simply making uh, simply uh, de facto standards defined by a single party. Uh, and there are of course big risks to anyone that is uh, not 
not uh, uh, part of the, the stakeholder as well. And, and we'll talk more about, uh, about this at the very last of the thing of the presentation. Yes, it's a bit unfair. Um, if you have a non-standard product uh, and you want to uh, you want to get into the open standard space and you can create problems for the open standards uh, as a result, right? So if you want to, if you, if you don't like uh, the concept of open standards and you really would prefer to have a de facto standard instead, there's many ways you can derail that process. You can, you can sort of uh, try to push out an open standard and establish your own, own, uh, your own monopoly, if you will, uh, to replace an open standard uh, based ecosystem. Those are definitely risks, and then there are uh, cases where that has happened. Uh, so it is not uh, certainly not outside their own possibility. Uh, it's sort of like democracy in some ways. Uh, just because you have a democratic system, does not guarantee that a system will always remain democratic, unless all of the stakeholders remain vigilant to make sure that yes, it does remain a democracy. So there are real life de, uh, de facto standards, and me sharing these examples uh, to an economist, this will be very dead obvious as to what the problems are when you have these sort of de facto standards are really effectively monopoly. So there are some historical examples already talked about AT&T. AT&T was, was recognized as a monopoly, it was recognized that it has strong network effect. So uh, by regulation, it was broken up into, uh, in, into multiple different companies in the United States so that it cannot become a monopoly. Uh, it doesn't have such large market size that it defines the decisions in the market so that there can be other smaller players like Sprint or, uh, or what have you. It doesn't have to be AT&T or nothing. Um, Standard oil company. This was another, uh, another case where this was subjected to, uh, subjected to uh, anti-monopoly laws. United States uh, Steel, uh, now it's no longer the case uh, but United States Steel was it was another monopoly that that was subject to re, subject to regulation because it had such strong uh, monopoly power. They had economies of scale. They could have massive uh, uh, massive factories that nobody could, nobody else could compete with. You can argue to some extent the government of China today uh, is actually in the same position when it comes down to um, certain manufacturing sectors. So what are the perils of monopoly power? What is the problem? Why, why should we be concerned with anybody having monopoly power in, in a given space? Uh, and after I, I do this uh, talk, I will pause and uh, sort of ask you and, and take any questions that you may have. Okay, uh, so the perils of monopoly power are well understood. Right? If you look, open up any, uh, even economics 101, one or two textbook, it will tell you what are the problems with, with monopoly power. These are higher long-term pricing. So when you're the only game in town, you get to benefit yourself. So there is there is that you know very simplistic supply and demand. So you can control if you can control supply all on your own, then you can control price. Uh, you can't control, and ultimately, if demand is what it is, and you, you are the supplier, you get to define what the price should be, whether it should be up or down. You can uh, so it's not always about higher pricing, also. Uh, so in, in terms of monopoly power, you actually want to, uh, uh, if you price your product way too high, you're inviting trouble. Yeah, because what that creates is if it creates such a big imbalance, there will be other, other players that come in and try to break into, into your monopoly. So another tactic that uh, monopoly, monopolists often will employ is something called predatory pricing. Uh, in particular, they will employ this uh, tactic if they already have monopoly power and they see a new entrant, a new probable entrant into their market, or they see that uh, you know one of their uh, smaller competitors that are in that space are gaining a bit too much market power. You can set the price so low, at least for a period of time, so that you either make zero profit or net negative profit for, for a period of time. Uh, so that you're driving out the competition. The, the competition simply won't survive, simply won't, can, won't be able to afford uh, to be in, in that market space. Uh, one could say that Walmart employs predatory, predatory pricing uh, to, to one extent or, or, or the other. Uh, and it's very difficult because of, economy scale, of economies of scale to compete with, with, uh, with Walmart. You can uh, again uh, kind of sort of say the same thing about Amazon. Uh, that they tend to uh, set price so low that it's very difficult for a smaller competitor uh, to even compete in that space where they're making uh, uh, sufficient profits because of volume 
you can't actually compete with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis unless you also have that volume and are making profits due to that volume. There's usually fewer market choices. Uh, you know, uh, fewer, very high entry barriers. It's very difficult to break into a space that has a has a has a monop has a monop one or more uh, parties that behave sort of like a monopoly. You can do all kinds of anti-competitive behaviors, starting from um, market negative marketing or uh, you know controlling suppliers, controlling demand, uh, etc. There's uh, and changing arbitrarily changing. Uh, interfaces, there's many different anti-competitive behaviors to try to preserve your mon monopoly uh, that you can engage in. Um, creating demand, creating hype. Mon monopolists are, are uh, in a position to create uh, create hype to try to drive off, to try, try to fend off competition. These are all anti examples of anti-competitive behavior. Um, low levels of competition, long-term innovation usually suffers. Uh, you know, there's, there's no incentive for a monopolist to really innovate on, on a consistent basis um, and overall lower qualities of service over a period of time, especially once a uh, monopoly has taken hold. Uh, it is very easy to lower uh, investment in, in innovation and lower quality of service as well. Uh, if there's an ecosystem built upon um, this thing that sort of had these monopoly characteristics, it is it becomes a very high risk uh, ecosystem. If that thing that is a monopolist collapses, it means that entire ecosystem collapses with it because it's so dependent on a single point of failure. Okay. So we talked a, l a lot about um, what can go wrong. Let's talk about open standards and why uh, they make things go right. Uh, you know, in, in in these in these sort of circumstances. Before we do that, I, again, I'd like to stop for a little bit and check the chat. I haven't seen any, any chat come by, but also give you an opportunity to come off mute uh, and ask any questions that you may like. Anybody? Okay, great. Let's keep moving forward. Um, we're almost halfway through. We're, we're making good progress. So this is the heart of all open standards. If there's a single diagram to explain what, what is an open standard precisely, uh, this is it. So the heart of open standards, remember, uh, it depends on a few different things. Uh, it depends on a well-defined, well-understood process that cannot be changed arbitrarily on a whim of a single party or individual. Uh, it, it needs to be fully participatory participatory. In other words, anybody that wants to have a voice, wants to have a stake, should be able to do that with low entry barriers. Uh, and you should be able to implement the open standard uh, without uh, any undue barriers. Once you have these things in place, once you have full transparency, full participation, and open access, you have an open standard. Right? You, 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 th that is what will uh, stop what, what will mitigate the effect of, of the network effect. In other words, you can take advantage of the network effect. Uh, a lot of people hopefully are, should make use of the open standard. And that gives you advantage of the network effect without the, without the associated vendor lock-in because of this full participation and transparency. So typically open standards, uh, the participants are uh, groups of people. So these could be, you can think of these as, as Java user groups. Uh, they could be citizens, organizations. Uh, any, any particular grouping of, of individuals uh, can have input and be a stakeholder of an open standard. Uh, an individual can be on their own right. Um, even if they're not part of a broader group, uh, you should be able to uh, participate as an, as an individual into the process or at least have some input. Uh, and certainly organizations and in some cases governments uh, can also be part, parts, uh, parts of an open standard. Uh, an open standard needs to have a specific well-defined process, okay? Uh, that is, again, fully participatory and anybody can, can change it, if you will. Uh, and then and in the end, you produce the artifact, you, you produce a specification or the standard, and that comes with a, that means a certain um, amount of things, especially in terms of software. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. But whatever you produce needs to be in the open and, and consumable and implementable, easily within reason, implementable by anybody. Okay, so it is available to the globe. You do not need to be a stakeholder in order to implement, uh, implement a standard. You can simply be able to implement it if, if you so wish. Um, so 
Getting to be a, a little bit more specific, um, let's talk about Jakarta E uh, in particular, or formerly Java E. Uh, Java E does have a specific process, so I would encourage. I won't. I won't go through the process in entire process right now. Uh, I think it's unnecessary for uh, the, for the purposes of explaining a basic concept. But this is how the Jakarta E process looks like. So there is a well-defined process. You can participate in, in fine-tuning this process forward, and it is based on consensus. So you will see a number, a notice a number of times there's a, the word review in there. So there's a lot of review and guaranteed voting and guaranteed uh, consensus building for something to become a Jakarta E standard. Okay, I have a question, let me take it. Okay, 10 minutes left, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, keeping time, but thank you very much. So a specification does have certain parts to it in terms of software specifications. Um, it's called the specification triad, but it's really spec specification triads. Uh, so there is a specification document. Uh, there is a compatibility test kit. So this is basically, once you implement something against a standard, you ought to be able to pick up another piece of software called the compatibility test kit, uh, basically a set of test, uh, unit tests, if you will, or integration tests uh, that says, okay, yeah, I am compatible with this, with this standard. And you have compatible implementations. You have different implementations of, of, of the standard as well. So in some cases, in, in for example, in Java EE and the JCP, there's also something called the reference implementation. So this is the implementation that is guaranteed. You're guaranteed at least one implementation, one specific implementation. Uh, that is not the case with Jakarta E, by the way. In Jakarta E, basically, it is guaranteed that there will be one such implementation, but it's not necessarily the same one. It could be, uh, you know, a variable number of one. But it's actually encouraged to have at least two implementations in, in, in terms of Jakarta. So it's, it's even, in some senses, better than a reference implementation. Of course, you have the implementations. You can also have partial implementations, okay? And this is a bit of a dangerous thing. So when you look at partial implementations, you should be buyer beware. Right, you, you should be able to, uh, you should ask questions of, okay, when do you intend to be uh, fully uh, standards compliant? What is holding you back, right? Because partial implementations can, while it can masquerade as, uh, as uh, you know, conforming to the standard, in fact, they could be trying to establish a monopoly of a different kind, okay, by perpetually remaining in partial implementation that is actually not fully compatible and not fully, uh, fully vendor neutral. Now, all of these things do not happen in a vacuum. Um, there's another triad, if you will, that is necessary for these things to function. You need governance uh, in terms of Jakarta E, that is the Eclipse Foundation provides that governance. You need stakeholders, um, big and small. And again, in, in the case of Jakarta E, that is, that is in place. Uh, and you also need a community. That you need a community of people that care about this and actually are users of this particular thing. And hopefully that is the case uh, for Jakarta E also. Okay, now some people may argue that uh, there is a fundamental dichotomy between open standards and open source and somehow open source replaces open standards. So open source does help in some cases, uh, namely it, um, it makes it easy to create forks and uh, at least the source code uh, is, uh, is transparent, but it, it does not provide the level of guarantees that uh, open standards do. In fact, uh, when you're creating a fork, it'll probably be de facto inc incompatible. Uh, so there's definitely no concept of vendor or portability or, or vendor neutrality in that sense. In the end, you have to make a choice of, okay, I want to go with this particular uh, open source implementation in that interface, and that is not compatible with its fork. Similarly, there's no governance process per se that is guaranteed. Just because something is open source does not necessarily mean that it is vendor neutral. It can still be very much controlled by uh, a narrow set of parties. So open source does not guarantee these things. The only thing it guarantees is you can create a fork easily, and you can take a look at what is going into the the sausage, if you will. So what you actually need is open standards and open source. Uh, in fact, often um, the reference implementations uh, for uh, open standards should be open source. And there is plenty of examples of this. If you really look at the most successful bits of infrastructure that is running, uh, running our technology market today, these are a combination of open standards and open source. So definitely do not get into this trap of thinking that open source is somehow uh, just because they have both have the word open in them is somehow equivalent. They are not, absolutely not. Uh, open standards provide much more guarantees 
uh, in terms of vendor neutrality and healthy market competition, open source provides yet another kind of guarantees, and that is also important. Now, there's lots of things that people will complain about open standards, right? So they'll say it's slow, it's designed by committee, they don't 100% guarantee compatibility, uh, they don't have my particular feature that I'm looking for, XYZ, uh, they don't innovate, or it's just a bunch of vendor experts. Uh, now, the reality is all of these uh, arguments are effectively examples of straw man arguments. Uh, so they are taking a concept and pretending as though it is a perfect concept when it is clearly not, uh, and then making a comparison. Oh, that, you know, there's clearly problems with it because it's not perfect. Well, as we know, in real life, very few things are perfect. Um, you know, uh, in, in reality, everything is uh, aiming towards achieving something. And there's always a balance between where things are at the moment and uh, how they can be improved, right? So standards are slow, yes, uh, that is true. Um, and getting things right and, and getting consensus takes time. Uh, it's much, uh, takes more time than simply making a decision by a monopolist. Uh, it is not designed, designed by committee is sort of, uh, again, taking that uh, example of a straw man argument. Really, what do you want in the end? Do you want a benevolent dictatorship? So those are not committees, right? So they can, definitely decisions can be made by a single individual or party. Uh, but do you want consent or do you want consensus? And if you want a consensus, then there's no other alternative than to have a discussion in a group of people in a quote unquote committee uh, and have votes. Uh, that is how committees ultimately work. Uh, and standards don't guarantee portability, that is true. Uh, uh, standards improve portability. They do not guarantee necessarily portability. That's up to you uh, and, and the uh, participants of the standard, but they're still better than a lock-in, right? So in a lock-in, you you're forced to make a choice, whereas in, in portability, you at least uh, have a choice, a viable one, even if you need to make some changes from, uh, from, from, port from one thing to the other. Uh, standards should not have every single feature uh, uh, baked into it. That is a bloated standard. Uh, and uh, in, in that case, you, you, standards will become too complex for, some, for people to implement or use. So you definitely need to take a min more minimalistic approach when you're talking about standards. And you can always build upon standards also. Standards do innovate. Uh, standards in the end are a collaborative engineering activity. Uh, yes, it's, its purpose is perhaps not innovation. Its purpose is to take a proven idea and make it more broadly available and implementable, but standards do actually do innovate. In, in fact, there's plenty of innovation, examples of innovation that happens certainly in Java E and Jakarta E. Uh, it's not a bunch of vendor experts. Uh, it hasn't been for years. I, mean, I, I am an example of that. I've been part of the JCB for a very long time. Now part of the part of the uh, part of the Eclipse Foundation. So you can uh, be a non-vendor, and, uh, and there's plenty of such examples of, of, of such people. But ultimately, it is all up to you, right? So you need to participate to make sure um, that whatever is uh, less than optimal, whatever is not right, you have to say. It, these are this is something that matters even if it is not not perfect today i'm going to participate and make it better okay so jakarta e as you know if you want to find out more about it and you do make the decision to participate uh, that is the website for it uh, the jakarta e ambassadors are here to help you uh, we're one example of uh, a stakeholder if you will in 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 jakarta e we're sort of a group of people that stay engaged and even some, most of the time actually participate on an individual basis but we do try to collectively do something together so if you want to participate you can definitely do that to the jakarta e ambassadors uh, finally i do want to uh end on a note of balance uh so i'm by all means a believer in open standards right so open standards i think in in most cases where there is a clear network effect uh, you should have open standards and that is uh, to maximize uh, value and, and minimize risk for a broad spectrum of people most importantly consumers um, but is, are open standards the only answer uh, they are not very few things in life are that are that black and black and white first of all not everything should be standardized uh, you know, there should always be extensions over standards uh, that expand frontiers uh, and innovate, if you will. That is a space for innovation. Uh, I think microprofiler does strikes this balance relatively well. Um, you know, standards should adopt common, mature, and proven ideas. And I think Jakarta E does a good job of that. 
uh, of being relatively conservative in terms of what is actually included in the standard. Um, you also have to uh, have a prove, proven, proving ground for alternative approaches and innovation because standards on their own uh, can also become corrupt or sort of stray from what they should be, right? So the, uh, if uh, there's only a small number of players in, in a, an established number of players in an, open, in an open standard and not a lot of new entrants, it can essentially become an oligarchy of some sort. So that's why you need a counterbalance to standards. It's always a good idea to have plan B um, uh, in, in all of these cases. So I, I, don't think, um, I, I don't think it's utopia that it's only open standards is, is the only answer. I think there should always be another alternative uh, that at least provides a counterbalance of some kind. Uh, and there is, it, it, there is possible for, uh, coexistence is possible, right? So it is definitely not a zero sum game. Uh, even in the Java ecosystem alone, it is a very, very large ecosystem. You can have more than one answer. It does not, and not and nothing needs to be a single answer uh, only. So uh, we should part, treat it as sort of parts, part of the ecosystem, even if, it, even if something may not necessarily be an open standard. Uh, and you should value them as counter counterweights. Uh, it's always good to have competition makes you better in the end, uh, and, and it's uh, it's good for everyone. And even from an open standards perspective, uh, you know it makes sense to have uh, answers beyond open standards. Uh, ultimately, choice is good, right? So uh, it is all all up to you, uh, and you can don't underestimate your own voice, right? So ultimately, you can affect outcomes by becoming a, an intelligent and engaged consumer. Uh, of any of these things, including uh, Java frameworks and, and Java open standards. That's it. I really appreciate it. I hope this was uh, worth your time. As I said, this is not uh, particularly a technology talk. Um, again, I appreciate uh, Jaycon uh, for having this talk with me. Uh, and I think I'm going to wrap it up. I'm, we're almost out of time. I believe I, I think we're all one minute over time, in fact. So I'm going to let you go. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, you know, out of band. I'll share my contact information with you now. I'll share it in the chat.